Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the U.S. Transhumanist Party Virtual Enlightenment Salon of May 16th, 2021. My name is Janati Stolyarov II, and I am the chairman of the United States Transhumanist Party. Today, we will have a fascinating conversation for you about economics, environmental issues, the impact of technology upon these areas, and how all of these aspects will shape humankind's future. We have a distinguished panel today of U.S. Transhumanist Party officers, members, and guests. We have our Director of Applied Innovation, David Shoemaker. We have our Director of Visual Art, Art Ramon Garcia. We have our Director of Community Resilience, Alexandria Black. We have our members, Edward Hudgens and Jason Geringer. We have a special guest, Max Marty. And for our uh, focal guests, uh, we have two individuals who are familiar to the transhumanist community uh, who have been quite prolific in their influence, both in Europe and uh, in some cases in Latin America, in the United States. We have uh, Dr. Jose Cordero, who is our foreign ambassador in Spain and our technology advisor. And we have Didier Kernel, who uh, represents the AFT Technoprog, the uh, French Transhumanist Association. And we will have an exchange of views about economics, particularly as it relates to changing technological and environmental possibilities. Didier Kernel has been involved in the creation of a document called the Viridian Manifesto. And I will share a link to the Viridian Manifesto in the YouTube chat for everyone to consider. But I would also ask Didier to provide his introductory remarks about this document, as well as the vision that he describes as Viridian economics. So welcome, Didier, and please proceed. Hello, uh, um, Gennady. Thank you for this uh, introduction. Thank you for organizing uh, this. Uh, yes, like you said, uh, the Association Française Transhumaniste Technoproc uh, uh, wrote this uh, text uh, no, a little bit more than one year ago. And there was also a two days uh, conference about this text. I want to insist uh, about the fact that this uh, text is not a, a final one. Uh, it's uh, the modest contribution of the Association Française, Transhumaniste, and uh, we have to improve it. Uh, we have to improve it uh, for uh, concrete examples. We have to improve it uh, uh, for some uh, technical aspects. And also we have some to have some discussions about uh, what we think are the best uh, solutions. And, uh, and for this, it's great to have here this, uh, this uh, first, uh, first uh, discussion. And I will enjoy especially the, the concrete proposals uh, to, to change the text. Okay, now coming to this text. First, uh, why this title, Viridian, uh, Viridian Manifesto? The Viridian is uh, a blue, green uh, color, uh, Viridian color. And uh, this, is, this was used uh, uh, already since, uh, I think more than 20 years ago, uh, by some uh, um, green people who were in favor of uh, technological progress, but with the idea, uh, this is very important for a sustainable planet. And this is maybe the, well, this is the key idea of uh, this, this uh, manifesto. It is, uh, uh, we need a sustainable world uh, with, uh, and technological progress can help. Of course, other things can help also, but we are not going to, to speak so much about uh, other things uh, uh, today, uh, yeah. So what, uh, what do we have in this text? And maybe I will try to speak uh, more about um, economic aspects than about, uh, let's say, uh, other aspects, but we will see. So first, uh, um, the, the first thing is that we need uh, more uh, collective research. 
And this means uh, uh, that we have to invest uh, uh, massively, that we have to invest uh, massively uh, for uh, sustainable development research. Uh, um, with one aspect uh, important for the association, uh, for the IFT, but maybe not for others. Uh, one aspect that it's important to have uh, public funds. So um, they are uh, one of the main aspects concerning uh, um, the, the Viridian aspect is the question of uh, renewable energy. So we have to uh, capture and to store abundant renewable energy. Uh, concerning the question of uh, nuclear power, who is the alternative, uh, the, on, the only alternative uh, uh, sustainable uh, energy, uh, we have kind of a pragmatic way that I will already develop in a few words. Uh, so we think that it's better to limit it uh, for two reasons. First, because, the, let's be honest, because the public opinion is so strongly against it that it's uh, almost impossible to change. Secondly, and this is not so, this is also a very important question, because uh, the, the progress to have uh, abundant uh, nuclear energy, they are still in the future of 10 or 20 years, but they are in this future of 10 or 20 years, 10 or 20 years since uh, already uh, at least 40 years. So the, technical, the technological progress for nuclear energy is quite slow. Okay, uh, that's for the aspects concerning renewable energy. No, uh, there are all other aspects concerning the use of, uh, of uh, material. So we are, this is kind of a more classical, uh, no, this is kind of classical. We uh, promote reuse and remediation to limit pollution at the source, to ensure recycling, uh, to develop remediation technologies. Well. The greens, the classical greens are saying that also, but we want to uh, say clearly in this domain, like in the other domains, that uh, yeah, new technology and new technological uh, research can help uh, for this, help, help, uh, sorry, can help us for this, and can help us uh, especially for one other problem uh, concerning uh, energy that I forgot to, uh, to quote already. It's the problem of, uh, storage of uh, energy. So the questions related to uh, batteries, uh, it's kind of strange. So to have, uh, to ha when, you, when you use uh, um, sustainable renewable energy like wind, uh, sol solar power and so on, you need to storage it more than with other source of energies. So we need good technologies for this. Uh, okay, uh, then uh, of course, uh, well, of course. Then we, we need also better automation, better robotization, um, uh, among other things in the agricultural, agricultural fields, uh, because there, uh, there are many, let's say, green people who say, yeah, we need more ecological and green uh, agriculture, but they are always thinking about this in a kind of uh, work intensive way. And work intensive way is not always ecological, far from. And uh, also that's something that many people don't want, <laughs> let's be honest. It's not so funny to be, uh, to work in, uh, in farms. So if you have, if you, we really use uh, robotization automation, it can be uh, quite greener, a greener way to have uh, agriculture. Okay. Um, then I will say, two or three uh, words about more um, yeah, classical transhumanist think. And uh, for those who here who, who know about me, they know that my first interest is about longevity. So what's the, the, the link between uh, longevity and uh, sust a sustainable world? In a world where people know that they are going to live for potentially for centuries, they will be a lot more careful about their environment. They will be a lot more careful, not only for the others in the next generations, but for themselves. That's uh, uh, one important point. And the fact is also the, the, the problem, many, many people say about uh, life extension, but we will have a, a, a crowded world. That's precisely the way around. In the countries where people have 
uh, longer life, they have fewer children, so it's good also for uh, for the planet. Then the last, uh, um, let's say, uh, really transhumanist point is a point about uh, uh, neuroscience. Uh, we think, but that's not for a very close future, but we, we think that uh, uh, to avoid our predispositions to more, to, to always consume more, uh, and that makes us uh, kind of uh, ecological, ecologically irresponsible, we can use, uh, yeah, uh, we can change our, our brains in a not so far future. Of course, this is, these are questions who can be, who are very uh, complicated because there is a question of free will and so on, but still we were speaking about this at the end of the text. That's it for my uh, brief presentation. Uh, thank you for, and I hope that uh, my, my English was not uh, too bad, uh, otherwise I will write also in the chat if something was not clear. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Didier. And I think you did quite well in summarizing the essential points of the Viridian Manifesto. It certainly raises a lot of fascinating areas for consideration that we will delve into as this conversation progresses. One point that I would like to highlight is the connection that you made between greater longevity and extended time horizons for individuals to care more about larger scale environmental impacts because if people believe that they are personally more likely to experience certain adverse consequences, then they will be more inclined to avoid those consequences through their behavior and factor in the longer term in their decisions. But there are other aspects that you discuss that we will certainly delve into as this conversation progresses, including the relationship, if any, between longevity and population, uh, questions about how to address nuclear power and potentials for future neuroscience to alter uh, at least the incentives uh, built into certain human ways of thinking. So thank you for bringing up all of these topics. Now we will also hear the introductory remarks from Jose Cordero. And Jose, after you provide your introductory remarks, uh, please feel free to also give your comments on DDA's presentation. And then I will ask DDA to comment on Jose's presentation as well, after which we will take the discussion to the broader panel. So Jose, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much. And it is a pleasure to be here back again with the US Transhumanist Party. And um, I want to talk in a similar line about the future of economics and the future of environment from a, a different, but I would say maybe even complementary perspective. And um, for that, let me share a few slides. Uh, I work with the Millennium Project and we, we talk about all the global challenges of humanity, which include uh, uh, sustainability, economics, energy, and many more. And it was one of the founding faculty of Singularity University. And actually my area was uh, renewable energy and the environment. And I also try to combine this always with uh, economic development and exponential trends. Most people are familiar with the book by Ray Kurzweil, The Singularity is Near, that he will be publishing the continuation this uh, fall. The book is called The Singularity is Near Air, where he basically ratifies his ideas and he explains how we are moving faster and faster towards the singularity by the year 2045. And he has been saying for uh, um, uh, quite a few years by now. And then what is happening is that things are changing exponentially faster, smaller, cheaper, and better. All technologies that can be digitized advance very quickly and not linearly, but exponentially. And we know the power of exponentiality, doubling, 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 doubling. It's incredibly fast as opposed to linear changes. And I like to give the example of a computer cards IBM punch cards that I used 40 years ago, uh, they were one, 1K, 1K of memory, 
they were substituted by floppy disk. The first generation also 1K, and then different, uh, better floppy disks, smaller with more memory. So basically, we have gone in the last 40 years from 1K to 1 tera, 1 terabyte, and this will continue. But this is happening in all technologies, not only with computers. It is happening in biology. It is happening in medicine now that we have digitized it. And you can see the, the cost of the human genome dropping even faster than Moore's law, even faster. And it is dropping twice in cost and in time. But what is happening with the population of the planet? Actually, the population is stabilizing and it is beginning to decline. It is declining already in Europe, in Japan, in uh, Russia, and it will soon collapse in China. And when I say collapse, it is really tragic what will happen in China. It will go from over 1.4 billion people to only about only 700 million people. So it is going to have by the end of the century. And this is a huge problem in China. Uh, but on the other hand, economics keeps on moving fast exponentially. If you look at the economic development uh, since the Industrial Revolution, when the average GDP per person per capita was around $1,000 per person per year, then it began moving up, up exponentially to $10,000 per person per year. And now it is moving up to $100,000 per person per year. And the poorer countries are catching up. That is the beautiful part. The poorer countries are catching up. In fact, the whole world is growing faster. The United Kingdom was the first country in human history that doubled its income per capita during the Industrial Revolution, and it needed 58 years. Then the USA was faster, 47 years, Japan faster, uh, 34 years, and today the world record is China. China every seven, eight or nine years is doubling its income per capita. And now India is catching up and even some African countries are catching up. This is beautiful. Uh, the economy is growing and it is growing exponentially. Uh, but this only started with the industrial revolution. Until the 18th century, we had the Malthusian trap and the world was poor and there was really a trap uh, you know, Malthus said that it was basically the end of the world, apocalypse then. Uh, and there was uh, already 1 million people living in London and 10 million people living in England. And he said that was the end. That was the end, too many people. 1 million people in London, forget it, horrible. Charles Dickens was writing about how horrible the conditions were in London and in the uh, United Kingdom. Well. Thanks to technology, the situation improved radically, radically, and the population also increased and the GDP grew exponentially. 100% uh, in the 19th century, 400% in the 20th century, and in this century, thousands and thousands of percent throughout the world, throughout the world. Remember, China is growing, India is growing, Africa is growing. You can also see this trend in the stock market. The oldest, uh, the biggest uh, stock market index is the Dow Jones Index. And you can see it over two centuries of exponential growth, truly exponential. So exponential, look at the vertical scale, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64. Over two centuries of exponential uh, growth. Obviously, there were ups and downs, like World War I, World War II, even now uh, the financial crisis and the COVID crisis. But uh, the Dow Jones Index has already recovered and it is growing exponentially. And this will happen throughout the planet. The economy is growing exponentially. Poor places like uh, China, you can look at Shanghai, how it changed so quickly. 
uh, between the end of last century and the beginning of this century. This is happening everywhere where there are people who want change, but some people don't want change, like the Amish. The Amish, they live in the 18th century and they want to live in the 18th century. Or even in Latin America, uh, some uh, Indian populations in South America live like they lived 2,000 years ago. They don't want to use clothes. They don't want to use technology. They don't want even medicine, vaccines. They don't want anything of our modern world. Uh, so people will be against, and we also have the anti-will people. When the will was invented 5,000 years ago, I am sure there were anti-will people. And Again, in London, uh, in the United Kingdom, when the Industrial Revolution began, there were the Luddites. And now we have the Neo-Luddites who want to stop economic progress. They said that the machines would take away our jobs. But actually, thanks to the machines, we live in this advanced world of today. And all of this we will be discussing in Transvision Madrid in October. So this is my advertisement so that you come to Madrid. We will talk about these issues. We will talk about the new book that Ray Kurzweil will be presenting, The Singularities Near Air. Uh, last time I brought Robot Sofia, who was again back in Madrid to talk about the elections. And uh, evolution continues, we humans continue, and we move into a world of prosperity, of abundance. We are leaving behind a scarcity and moving into a world of abundance. So anyway, those were my comments. And uh, just uh, to bring it back to, to what Didier was saying, of course, we need to be careful about the environment. And um, I translated a book of a friend uh, from Stanford. The book is called Clean Disruption. Uh, this is in Spanish, Disrupción Limpia, that talks about how to grow fast with clean energy, clean disruption. And this is, again, exponential. My other friend, Peter Diamandis, he talks about the future is faster than you think. And in his previous book, Abundance, he also talks about this. So we are moving into a world of abundance, abundance, which is important. And also my MIT colleague, Andrew McAfee, he wrote this book, More From Less, which is incredible, an incredible manifesto of worrying or uh, not worrying, but taking care of the environment, but also taking care of the economy. So these things are not incompatible. You can have economic growth, you can have uh, sustainability, and you can also have a uh, clean energy. All of this can be done and they are being done. So we just have to keep on pushing forward faster and faster. So those were my comments. We live in interesting times and it is only going to get better. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Jose. Uh, I appreciate your remarks and the fascinating presentation that you provided about various exponential trends in the improvement of the human species, the improvement in prosperity and living standards and other values that most humans would agree are important. So Didier, having heard Jose's presentation, what are your thoughts on it? Yes, first, uh, I, I will not say where I agree, except to say that I agree with uh, many, many aspects. I will say maybe the the, uh, the the most central point where maybe we vary or maybe not, I don't know, but um, I have the impression that you are saying, uh, uh, Jose, in very short, progress is coming, whatever we are doing. And really, I think that progress is coming, not whatever we are doing. And especially progress is uh, going only uh, in some directions at some times. Uh, I will give one example. Uh, if you compare the world today with the world 50 years ago, we are not going faster with the cars, we are not going faster with, uh, uh, in the space, we are not going faster in the planes. Well, because it was not a priority, and maybe it is, it's good that it was not a priority, uh, we can discuss about this. And uh, um, um, also, we are not living a lot longer than uh, 20 or 30 years ago. ago. 
because it, I think, because it was not a priority. So my 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 conviction is really that uh, we we have to have clear goals about which technological progress we want, and that it is going to uh, accelerate this progress. Of course, not. Uh, it's not like uh, we decide and uh, it's progressing there, but I think it can it can have an impact. Uh, that's that's probably the, the most important uh, difference, except if you agree. Uh, yeah, then uh, let's say less important, but uh, of course, uh, of course, we are richer, happier uh, in a better world than uh, one century ago. Progress was, was not always like that. Eh? For, for example, agriculture, uh, the people, uh, the people with agriculture. Uh, we are living shorter lives and uh, more less happy lives than with uh, when they were. Uh, uh, oh, um, I don't find the word, but uh, before agriculture. Uh, Hunter gatherers. Uh, yes, yes, it's that. Yeah, sorry, uh, that's one example. But okay, globally, uh, technological progress is good because technological progress is also good for the planet per inhabitant. There is this problem of the that's that's called the reborn effect. So when you have more people use more, but okay, uh, so uh, more is less, but uh, more is only a little bit less, and not in a situation where people can uh, uh, really uh, have more uh, with few money, and also not a, not in a, a situation where the population is uh, increasing. I agree uh, totally with what you said about uh, population increasing, except for sub-Saharan uh, countries. There, uh, the growth of the population is decreasing, but not fa fast enough to be uh, uh, easily sustainable. That's, uh, let's say, may maybe not even the, disagree the disagreements, but the accents I want to uh, put when I was uh, listening to uh, to Jose. Uh, yeah. Yes, thank you, DDA. And Jose, would you like to respond? Uh, yeah, sure. Well, obviously, nothing is granted in the future. We have to work towards that. Uh, but we are not as stupid. We humans, we have only not a mouth to eat and destroy and hands and and asked to, uh, um, to do bad things. We have a brain, we have an incredible brain uh, with which we create wealth and we find problems and we solve problems. So of course we have problems now, but we will solve them. And this is actually what Charles Dickens portrayed in his books also about the condition of London. Uh, you know, over two centuries ago, but then look at London today compared yeah. to how dirty, sick and a bad place it was at the time. So, of course, nothing is given, nothing is granted, but we use our imagination, our creativity, our powers to solve them. And also, I think we have to be positive about the future, that we can solve the problems and the biggest problems are the biggest opportunities. This is one of the things we used to say at Singularity University, mm. that if you want to become a billionaire, you just need to help uh, a billion people and sell them some products or help them with some ideas. So I, I think we are moving in the right direction. Again, the environment today is much better than in the past in many places. The, the yeah. green forests are coming back. Deforestation is stopping in many places. So it is not the end of the world. And this is part of my hope to end this negativity because we live in the best times ever, ever in human history. There has never been so much prosperity, intelligence, longevity, even happiness. So I think we have to convey that, that this is the best time to be alive. Yeah, but if I can directly answer, yes, uh, totally agree. We live in the best uh, time uh, ever, uh, longer, better, and you are totally correct for the environment, uh, especially for an example like uh, London. Uh, even 50 years ago, there were uh, people uh, dying because of uh, uh, atmospheric pollution. 
uh, and now you can uh, fish in the Thames uh, and uh, the, the atmosphere is good. But there are other aspects who are really uh, worrying. Uh, for me, the most worrying things, thing is uh, this disappearance of uh, insects. We don't know why, but we know that they are really very fast uh, disappearing. And yeah, the, the fact that we don't know why, for me, it's kind of, uh, so it could be that we are living at the best time uh, ever, but uh, that the future will, would, uh, will be worse because of, uh, of some, it could be, I don't think, so maybe it's also a way, a way uh, we agree that the future is not sure. You want to speak, uh, I would say, not only, but really mostly about the good side. I want, and I think many other transhumanists I want to speak, I would say, about the good side and the bad side. We have to, to, to think about uh, uh, both aspects together, especially, um, especially concerning existential risk. So pollution and so on can be an existential risk, but probably the, the biggest existential risk and the biggest hope at the same time, it's artificial intelligence. So I, uh, yeah, <laughs> but that's for another time for this discussion, because I, I know that you are also there, probably more optimist but also, also uh, certainly wanting to be, to speak more about positive aspects. You know, uh, okay, uh, no, maybe, maybe the last sentence. Uh, I agree, for example, with uh, Nick Bostrom and with other people when they speak about existential risk, they say, even if there is only one chance, 1% one chance of that, that it's going bad, we have to be very careful for this because, uh, well, if it happens, we will not have a second chance. Yes, thank you, Didier. And uh, I'll make one uh, point before uh, I ask Jose to respond. Uh, it's interesting that you pointed out that certain technological advancements may have slowed down as compared to the rate of progress in the mid 20th century. So for instance, from 1903 to the 1960s, uh, humans went from the first instance of powered flight to supersonic aircraft. And yet at present, uh, there is nothing superior to uh, what the Concorde had been in terms of uh, supersonic passenger flight. Indeed, one cannot uh, book a supersonic flight today. Uh, likewise, life expectancy increased dramatically uh, from about 1900 to uh, say the 1970s, the 1980s, but the increases in life expectancy have been far more modest since that time. And in the 2010s and certain so, so, demographics, so it, they've reversed. May, may I just correct for you for this last thing? Uh, be careful, actually not in the world. It's in the US, in Europe that, yes. the, that it's going, uh, but in, in the rest of the world, it's actually growing even faster. Well, that was before COVID, eh? because, but I, I think it's important to say. So there is kind of a, maybe a plateau, but uh, at the world level, we are still increasing. Just, yes, uh, uh, not, so- not, not in the US uh, and uh, less in, the U, in Europe, yeah. Yes, regions of the world which have had more catching up to do because they started out in worse material conditions with lower quality of healthcare, have been able increasingly to catch up with the Western world so that the average global life expectancy is now in excess of 70 years. But in the United States, for instance, the average male life expectancy from birth has been hovering uh, around 77, 78 years for a very long time now. And I have been waiting uh, for over a decade for it to exceed 79 years, but it hasn't happened yet. I think COVID is going to make that more difficult. We had a virtual enlightenment salon with Jason Crawford last year. And Jason Crawford is a scholar in the field of progress studies. He looks at historical drivers of technological progress. And essentially tries to identify the factors that allow progress to take on this exponential tendency in certain areas. And certainly that has been the case uh, with information technology, for example, uh, some areas of uh, biology, uh, biotechnology, at least in the research 
field, but there are certain institutional factors that I think are holding back that progress from benefiting consumers to the extent that it could benefit consumers even in the status quo. So uh, I think it is important to continue this conversation uh, between, on the one hand, uh, recognizing the potential and in some cases the reality of exponential progress. On the other hand, though, recognizing that it's not inevitable and it can be constrained by certain societal and cultural factors and political factors as well, that we should think about ways to overcome in order to uh, unleash the benefits of that innovation in more areas. So Jose, what are your thoughts about this? Well, first, uh, I think it is important to consider cultural differences uh, among countries and even continents. I lived a long time in the USA. I lived several years in Asia, in Japan, Korea. I have visited China many times, and I am now living in Europe. In Europe, there is mainstream Euro pessimism. In fact, that is the word that has become sadly popular, Euro-pessimism. And I think that uh, many people, uh, DDA in a way represents this trend of pessimism, fear of the future, fear of the unknown. And um, in the USA, people are more moderate. I'd like to say that Asia is the future, the USA is the present, and Europe is the past. Um, and I give this in a global context with my experience living and traveling continuously. But anyway, besides this Euro pessimism that I fight, I attack because it is destroying our livelihoods even in the future, because I made the last uh, interview to Sir Arthur C. Clarke. I went to visit him in Colombo, Sri Lanka to interview him. Uh, just before he died. And um, he was a visionary, a futurist. He talked about space travel, immortality, cryopreservation, uh, nanotechnology, all the things that we talk about even today. And he told me one thing about the future. He said, what we have in our minds become self-fulfilling prophecies. If we are negative, if we are pessimist, we will probably destroy the world. But if we are positive, if we are optimist, we will probably save humanity. And uh, not just him, uh, I mean, Sir Arthur C. Clarke, who was a genius in many ways, but other people have been talking about that and don't actually correlations between life expectancy and happiness and optimism. And it happens to be that the people who, who are more optimistic tend to live longer. Even in the concentration camps in Germany, the people who have a dream, who were positive, who were optimist, even in the concentration camp, were the ones who could, uh, who had more chance to survive and to have a, a, a life afterwards. So I believe it is important to convey this optimism that of course there are problems. There are many problems. There will always be problems, but we will be there to solve them. So that, that's part of my message, really. We need to solve the problems that come up. There will be new problems tomorrow and the new problems the day after, and we will solve them. This is what humans do. We solve problems. We use our imagination, not only what we eat and what we destroy and what we excrete, what we create, what we imagine. So our minds actually are in incredible. That is why I like to say humanity has advanced so much. In the time of Malthus, population of London was about 1 million, uh, England 10 million, and the whole planet 1 billion. And he said it was the end. It was nothing else. Uh, Charles Dickens was right. Poverty, disease, hunger, that is the future of humanity. But technology came, the machines came, even against the Luddites, and the machines took away their jobs, thankfully, and they move up the ladder. They move up the ladder of um, Abraham Maslow. Instead of survival and dirty work, we are having better and better works, a better job. So this trend will continue. I am positive, I am optimist, I am pushing for this positive view 
Of course, I am concerned, Didier, I am concerned. We have also technology to destroy all of us, but we have to be positive. We have to try to create a better future. And, and that is um, my hope, and not only mine, other people who are very positive and optimistic, like my friends, Peter Diamandis, and also Ray Kurzweil. And I saw a question by David Wood, about uh, his book, The Singularity is Nearer, that has been delayed. Yes, it has been delayed because in this time of pessimism, in this time of COVID, it's not good to release such a positive book. Uh, so the, the publisher has decided to wait until the end of the pandemic to publish the book. And hopefully by September, or October, most of the world will be back to a new normality. And that is when the book will be published. Again, this is the point of philosophy of, of uh, psychology more, psychology. Our minds have been bombarded continuously with negative messages. So it is hard to see the positive messages and the singularity is nearer. It's a very positive book. It's a book full of hope, full of dreams, full, full of the things that we humans are going to do. Yes, thank you very much, Jose, for those remarks and also for answering David Wood's question. Uh, indeed, perhaps this delay will help make the singularity as nearer, uh, even more relevant to uh, recent events. I know Ray Kurzweil in his past writings has stated that World War I, World War II, the Great Depression have not appreciably affected the exponential growth of technology. I would be curious if the singularity is nearer, will address any uh, observations that Kurzweil might have on the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, but I suppose we will find that out uh, within a few months time. Now I would like to open up the discussion to our panel. I know there are several questions already which are quite interesting. Let us go to Jason Geringer, who has several questions for DDA. So Jason, please proceed. Oh, um, where was I? Uh, about the, um, the one, the PowerPoint about restricting business practices that encourage overconsumption. Uh, what would Exactly, you say is overconsumption, and what kind of uh, restrictions are you thinking? Mm. So, uh, this, this is more um, in a in the future we could uh, yeah change our way to think through uh, neuroscience, and one of the important aspects is that we are a kind of uh, made uh, for. Um, uh, for a world where there is absolutely no abundance and when you need uh, to uh, take everything that is available and that makes that in this world now, uh, we cannot stop uh, uh, growing consumption. We cannot stop uh, to uh, go always uh, behind uh, sustainable ways. And that's the idea uh, in short. But I, I wanted also to answer to uh, uh, the, the, the thing that, uh, uh, that Jose was saying, but maybe later. Yeah. Uh, and I see. Oh, yeah. OK. Yes. The, the nuclear question, maybe. <laughs> yeah, it will be. I think we can discuss the <laughs> nuclear energy question. Yeah we, yeah, we could go to that. That sounds interesting. I'm actually really curious to what you think about the, the nuclear question. I know I'm a big fan of thorium. Mm -hmm. yeah. you know. Yes, uh, and I would, I would add that a lot of the concerns about nuclear energy arose from a much older generation of nuclear power plants that were created in the 1950s through the 1970s, and they had a certain risk of meltdown associated with them if proper safety precautions were not followed. Of course, there were incidents like Three Mile Island in uh, 1979 and Chernobyl in 1987 and then Fukushima in 2011. But Three Mile Island and Chernobyl, both of which were essentially caused by human error, uh, essentially uh, motivated this anti-nuclear energy movement. But it had an ironic side effect in that by thwarting the construction of 
newer next generation nuclear power plants, which are actually more inherently protected against meltdown. Uh, this movement capped us with the older nuclear power plants, which are more meltdown prone, and it has arrested progress in uh, that area, especially in certain countries like Germany, which has taken a, a very strong anti-nuclear energy stance, whereas if that resistance hadn't taken place, if those incidents were seen more as isolated incidents, then people might have learned the lessons, uh, here's what not to do to trigger another Chernobyl, and then they would have moved on and built safer nuclear power plants. The concept of uh, thorium nuclear power plants, uh, I think, is very promising as well. And uh, the USTP supports efforts to uh, adapt the thorium fuel cycle for uh, generation of energy. That seems to be a very safe and promising approach. Uh, but Didier, you stated that uh, essentially you think there's too much public resistance what? to the uh, usage of nuclear energy, even though France is, uh, for instance, one of the countries that generates about 80% of its power from nuclear yeah. power plants. And David Wood also makes the point in the chat that the general public is against anti-aging research too, uh, at least some segments yeah. of the general public are, and there's no reason to give up on that vision. So what of would course. be your response? Yes, uh, maybe I will begin with this, this question. That's, that's a good question. Uh, way to present it, but uh, there is no alternative for uh, longevity. Uh, and uh, for nuclear energy, there is an alternative that's uh, renewable energy. And uh, um, also at the moment, uh, nuclear energy, even if you uh, don't take in consideration all aspects of uh, people against it, it's uh, uh, more expensive because you need many uh, things to protect it. Uh, it's more expensive than solar energy and than wind energy. And uh, solar energy and wind energy, the only uh, real problem nowadays is storage. And this is not such a big uh, uh, problem because uh, storage is something uh, technically uh, quite easy. But I totally agree that the risk, uh, one, that the risk concerning nuclear energy were far exaggerated. Uh, so uh, Fukushima, Fukushima uh, killed about uh, nobody, and uh, even the Chernobyl uh, um, accident killed, uh, well, somewhere between uh, uh, a few uh, dozens and a few uh, thousands people, or maybe 10,000 people. It's nothing if you compare to, um, to air pollution, for example. I, I, I know that. Uh, okay, that's two reasons. I know the third reason is also um, yeah about thorium. Thorium uh, was the energy uh, of thorium and all the the new uh, uh, non well uh, the, the new ways to to make nuclear energy. Uh, that was the uh, supposed to be a closed future already uh, when I was young. When I was uh, I remember uh, listening to the TV uh, when I was about ten. So uh, almost 50 years ago, and they were saying, okay, uh, in 20, 30 years, we will have uh, uh, energy without limit. Uh, okay, and no, it's still uh, for to in uh, 20 or 30 years. And it's not because at this time, when I was wrong, there was no big resistance against the nuclear energy. So uh, not so easy to, uh, to create. On a way, it's... Uh, <laughs> It's better uh, that it's also uh, still uh, complicated because uh, uh, nuclear energy, well, and nuclear uh, weapons are, of course, very dangerous. Uh, yeah, that's that's in short. Uh, that's in short. Mm -hmm. And it, maybe if I can uh, go about, that's probably a, a thing. So uh, uh, Jose was speaking about uh, pessimism. Uh, that's uh, true that there, uh, pessimism concerning uh, and uh, people afraid uh, concerning uh, uh, nuclear energy was uh, really stopping things. But uh, concerning all the risk, I really, uh, I like this sentence, uh, today is the best day of the history of the human, of uh, mankind, of humankind. And, but today is also the, the most dangerous days, day of uh, humankind. So, uh, uh, Jose, I really think that we have to speak about both aspects, 
And uh, yes, well, first, uh, I don't think that the difference between uh, pessimism and the, in the US and pessimism in, uh, in Europe is so big, uh, because uh, for example, in the US, you have this very large uh, religious movement uh, wanting to go back also. But uh, what's for sure, it's in Europe compared to uh, the US at the moment, life expectancy is uh, higher in, uh, in Europe, far, far higher. And people are maybe not happy, but, but uh, yeah, they, they live longer. Energy, yeah, Jose. <laughs> energy. That's it. Yes, well, energy, I think, is going to be uh, a common thread to many of our conversations. Uh, I wanted to bring in a few comments from David Wood on this conversation. Uh, he points out that a part of the expense of nuclear energy is because of outdated excessive regulations, which made sense with older designs, but are less applicable to newer ones. He also states that another reason for the present expense of nuclear energy is because of lack of scale and learning. There are too few projects, hence not enough cost improvement. And I tend to agree one of the reasons why progress has been slower than some have anticipated is because it's confined to these antiquated regulatory frameworks. Uh, Jose, would you like to say anything more on that? Well, just going back to the issue of energy, indeed, this is a limitation to the advancement of civilization. And since we began with the first energy sources that we could find, including even fire, and then windmills, and then some kind of uh, dams, uh, we have moved very quickly into fossil fuels, which actually are going to be left fossil. Uh, I think the fossil era will finish in 10 years. Um, first, because indeed there are new types of nuclear energy. In fact, many people like uh, even Bill Gates has been financing new type of nuclear reactors. And in Japan, they are also working on different types of nuclear reactors. But also because we are moving into a world of uh, wind and solar energy after paying for the ca high cost of development. It was very expensive to develop solar energy and wind energy, but apparently we are learning and we will learn even more on the moon and on planet Mars because that will be part of the energy we will use in outer space. Um, solar energy a lot, and even some wind energy. Many of you probably saw the little Ingenuity helicopter on Mars. So it's learning how to use the wind, the atmosphere on Mars. Uh, we live in incredible times. We are learning so much. We will keep on learning so much. And uh, just to put a, a number, the amount of solar energy that reaches our planet is close to 10,000 times what we consume. Uh, it's incredible. We get 10,000 times more solar energy if we want to use solar energy, or we can use a nuclear power also, which is another high a highly condensed form of energy. Anyway, there is no short of, of energy. Also, we can uh, uh, get into antimatter. You know, antimatter would be the best way to produce energy. So there is plenty of energy. We are just babies. Uh, this is called the Kardashev energy scale. Uh, there was a very famous uh, astrophysicist, Nikolai Kardashev, who just uh, died last year in, in uh, Russia. And he created the scale of energy in the universe. And we are babies. We are truly babies. We are not even a civilization type one that he described as a civilization that uses all the solar energy that reaches uh, its planet, our planet in our case. We are not even half of type one civilization. And then there is type two civilization. If we use all the solar energy, in the solar system, in our case, and a type uh, three civilization, if we use this, the energy of the galaxy. Anyway, there is plenty of energy. We are just learning how to use it better. And this will be accelerated with the missions to the moon and to Mars. We truly live in incredible times. And this is not just daydreaming. This is happening. Uh, we are moving very fast. And um, David Wood, who made another comment, 
uh, that we, we cannot just be positive because obviously some things are impossible. Yes, um, but uh, we are not talking about anti-gravity here. Uh, maybe we are talking about anti-matter, but eventually maybe we discover there is anti-gravity. We don't know. Anyway, we keep on learning things and I am very scientific myself. Uh, as you know, I am an engineer uh, from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, which is in Cambridge, but not your Cambridge in England, my Cambridge in Massachusetts. And we just check things that work. And that is also why I'm working on anti-aging like DDA. We are interested in anti-aging because we know immortality is possible. Why is it possible? Because it already exists in nature. There are immortal cells, uh, germ cells. There are mutant immortal cells like cancer cells. There are immortal organisms. So the proof that immortality is possible is that it already exists. Very clear proof. And as an engineer, I try to copy what already works. I'm not creating anything. Uh, actually, my best example is cancer. Cancer didn't go to Cambridge or didn't go to MIT and it discovered how to become immortal. So if cancer could discover how to become immortal, we will. And very soon I'm convinced that in five to 10 years, we will cure most of cancers uh, in five to 10 years. So Gennady, we have to check this video in five and 10 years and see how many more cancers we have cured. Yes, that is quite an interesting challenge that you've set for humankind, Jose. And uh, I agree. Let us look back at this conversation and see if humankind is finally successful in the quest to defeat cancer. Now, I remember being a student in middle school, uh, circa 2000, and based on what I learned in the science classes, then I was absolutely confident that cancer would be cured in 15 years. Uh, yeah. So by 2015, I thought cancer would be uh, a legacy of the past, essentially. And unfortunately, that has not happened. But we've had two decades of, let's say, considerable turbulence by recent historical standards compared to, say, the 19... 70s through the 1990s, uh, the decades starting with 2000, uh, I think, were significantly more volatile in terms of outcomes for the human species. And I do think it's worthwhile to consider why that has been the case, but also to recognize the potential for technologies just on the horizon to actually transform the situation if these barriers to progress can be overcome. So I do hope in 15 years, uh, we will be uh, so fortunate that cancers will actually uh, be cured. Now, I would like to go to Max Marty because he has some questions uh, along the lines uh, that have been discussed. Thanks, Gennady. Uh, so, uh, I had a question. I wanted to to push you a little bit, uh, DDA, on the nuclear issue, but I think we've you know beaten that horse a little bit, uh, quite a lot in the past few minutes. So I'm going to move to a different question. But um, Jose, my question uh, is for you. So I completely agree with your argument. I've been sold on on this. Um, this argument since since uh, Matt Ridley's great book, The Rational Optimist from 2011. He makes similar arguments. Um, and I think he makes them very, very well and very eloquently as well. Uh, my question for you is, um, what would, uh, perfect, there you go. Yeah, I, 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 he is a wonderful author in, in so many ways um, and popularizer of, of scientific ideas and economic ideas. But my question uh, for you, Jose, is uh, what would, given your optimism, what would give you pause? What could we do or what wouldn't we, what, what could we not do in the coming years to, that would lead not necessarily to a global catastrophic extinction event? I don't, I don't mean that, of course, you know, thermonuclear war, runaway AI, sure. But what would lead more to like a stagnation or even a slight decline in the trends that we're talking about and that you think are, are important, that we all think are important? What could we do or not do that would potentially end the, at least for decades, if not centuries, end this um, 
this upward trend that you that you see? Uh, well, as you know, because we met a long time ago at Singularity University when I was in Silicon Valley in California. Um, I am from Venezuela originally. I was born and grew up in Venezuela, which is a, a total disaster, a basket case. It's worse than Cuba today or North Korea. So having gone through that, knowing the sad reality of countries like uh, Venezuela, where I grew up, uh, or Cuba that I visited, or even North Korea, I have been to North Korea as well. Um, I have seen the tragedy of humanity and what human stupidity can make. So that is why I, I think that um, artificial intelligence is good. You know, if we can become more intelligent, either naturally or artificially, I welcome that. I want to be more intelligent, uh, naturally and artificially. My worry is not artificial intelligence. My worry is human stupidity. That is truly my worry, human stupidity. And some ideas that look on paper very good, they are very bad in reality. Uh, so I can tell you, you know, the ideas of communism and socialism, because I have seen them, I have lived under those regimes. They look apparently okay in paper, but in practice, they are a total disaster. So I invite anyone who still believes in these ideas also from the 18th century, because this is when they were created these ideas, to go to Venezuela, to go to Cuba, to go to North Korea. And, and then you would change your mind, like I did. I have to say, like I did, uh, because I was in a way, uh, you know, very socially minded, and I am still, but now with technology. I was socially minded with wrong politics in the past. So I changed my point of view dramatically after going to East Berlin uh, when there was the Berlin Wall. I was in East Berlin the first time in 1985 and it was horrified when I saw East Berlin because it was pitiful compared to West Berlin. So that really changed my life. However, I don't want to politize, politicize this even more and actually was a candidate to the European Parliament where I get um, about 7,000 votes here in Madrid. And let me tell you, my campaign was, I am not from the left and I am not from the right. I am from the future. And I think we transhumanists, we have to say this, we are not leftists and we are not rightists. These are politics of the 19th century. Maybe the 20th century, the future is very different. Forget about left and right. We have to see what works and what doesn't work. And we transhumanists, we come from the future. We go to the future. So we have to be futurist and forget about left and right, which are old concepts. Uh, I prefer to see things that work and things that don't work. And that is very simple. I am an engineer. I see what works and I try to do it better. So, uh, Max, uh, I hope that that answers uh, your question. I look always for things that work. And that is also why I am so optimistic about curing cancer, uh, Gennady, in five to 10 years, because we did not have the genome sequence of cancer 15 years ago. Now we do. And we are comparing cheaply uh, cells with cancer, cells without cancer, we know that immortality is possible because it, it already exists. We just need to discover how to do it and do it well, do it better. That is why I am optimist because I believe in humanity. I believe in the human mind. As um, also it was discussed here, uh, there was this bed between Julian Simon and uh, Paul Ehrlich. Uh, in fact, my friend, um, from MIT, Andrew McAfee, he talks about this in his book. They bet, um, I think it was 10,000, yes, the resourceful earth, Julian Simon. Ed, thank you so much. That is a powerful book. And, and the other one, the continuation that was called, I think, human, uh, the human resource or? Um, the ultimate resource. Okay, well, that was also a fantastic book. And uh, that is why humanity has improved so much because we have more people, we have more brains, we have more ideas and we will do more things. But Max, just to close, my concern is 
human stupidity, and we are naturally stupid. That is my worry. Yes, thank you, Jose. And I also share some optimism in uh, the ability of emerging technologies to combat and cure cancer. I hope that uh, a lot of the research into mRNA vaccines that transpired during the COVID-19 pandemic can be cross-purposed uh, for cancer treatments as well. And of course, there are now more targeted immunotherapies that have been remarkably effective against particular kinds of cancer. So indeed, let's hope that the next 15 years are a lot more successful in this regard than the past 15 years have been. Uh, I'm curious if you think that human stupidity might have been one of the major impediments to progress during the past 20 years or so. Uh, do you think, technically speaking, we could have been further along as a species technologically and in terms of our standards of living, but aspects of human stupidity uh, might have held us back? And this is a question for Didier as well, in terms of what role do you believe suboptimal uh, thinking patterns or responses or irrational emotions within the human psyche are one of the leading factors restraining beneficial progress? Well, of course, this is restraining. Uh, we are made uh, for uh, times of uh, hunters, uh, gatherers. <laughs> And we are living in this time, so we are unable to uh, understand it. We are unable to feel it uh, perfectly. But uh, yeah, but also it would be, of course, uh, if we are using uh, all this technological progress without having uh, uh, more intelligence. So uh, human stupidity with artificial intelligence could be uh, even more dangerous that uh, human stupidity without artificial intelligence. So we, we can now uh, destroy ourselves. And that's, that's one of the uh, central, central, really central problems. But I want to speak about, um, I think, uh, so I, I uh, like I said, uh, I, I disagree about uh, these questions about pessimism and, uh, and uh, optimism, like uh, uh, optimism is good uh, and pessimism is bad. Uh, but uh, there is something we don't speak about. Uh, it's all these questions related to uh, how to better share the, lo the knowledge. For me, uh, we are living in a strange world with uh, two things that are really slowing down, down technological progress. One is uh, um, all questions related to um, intellectual property, the fact that no uh, Every, every time that somebody is discovering something, he's trying to have patents on this. And this is a political question on the white side, I would, I would say, because uh, <laughs> uh, Jose, you say, I'm not from links. I, I'm not uh, left wing, I'm not right wing, I'm not from the future, but okay, the future will be in some way left wing or right wing or something. Uh, it will not be neut neutral politically. Uh, and so that's one aspect, but the other aspect more on the left side of the, the political spe spectrum, I would say, is this uh, uh, tendency to make a, a kind of a absolute priority to privacy and especially to privacy against the state. So uh, we are not, more, not anymore able to uh, share uh, health data with scientists, with the uh, medical authorities. And uh, this is also, uh, I think, uh, very much slowing down uh, progress. So we live in a world, we had never uh, more scientists in the history of, of uh, humankind. We had uh, never more knowledge in the history, but we are, uh, and we had, we had never more uh, capacity to exchange this knowledge in a few uh, seconds but uh, we are not sharing knowledge as efficient in average now than, uh, uh, than before. Uh, and, and this is for me one of the uh, central problems, how to really share, uh, uh, share knowledge and how to work together for uh, yeah, a better health and a better uh, economy and so on. This is very, uh, uh, very important. You know, most scientists at the moment uh, one big part of the 
of uh, their work is just protecting their work and also uh, like uh, bureaucratic work and so on, but not uh, energy to search. Yes, I agree with you, DDA. Those are significant limitations. Indeed, the U.S. Transhumanist Party in its platform supports a, a far greater proportion of open source uh, types of approaches to research, to innovation and discovery, and also greatly shortening the time frame for medical patents because of the problems that you mentioned once a drug or a treatment is patented, it takes a long time for it to make it into the public domain where other entities can iterate upon it and improve it. And even after a drug has been generic for a long time, some entity might try to reappropriate it uh, by essentially showing that a different application for it has been found. So one drug might have been used to treat heart disease, and now it's been found that it can be used to treat high blood pressure, and it gets repatented and kept out of the public domain and the ability of others to innovate upon it. So definitely those are obstacles that can be uh, reduced at the very least. And there is a legitimate room for conversation about to what extent patents are needed to motivate innovation. I do think there are other ways, better ways to motivate innovation, like bounties. Uh, the U.S. Transhumanist Party has recommended in the course of the COVID-19 pandemic that instead of granting patents to the developers of vaccines, the various governments of the world could set specific bounties in advance for uh, companies or researchers who develop certain <clears throat> vaccines and manufacture certain quantities of them. And in exchange for those one-time payments, the developers would essentially release the technology into the public domain so that anyone can benefit from that technology and iterate upon it. And interestingly enough, recently, even though the system of bounties has not been implemented, but there has been an emerging consensus about waiving intellectual actual property protections for uh, vaccines that were manufactured in the West, even though the Biden administration opposed it initially, the, Gate Foundation, the Gates Foundation opposed it initially, now they are in favor of at least some limited waivers of intellectual property protections because it's been recognized to be imperative to spread these vaccines to as large a population as possible in the hopes of containing the uh, novel coronavirus. Uh, so, Yes. If I may interrupt you to say uh, you, you're totally right. And for this, I will give uh, uh, one uh, bad point, uh, especially for Europe, you know, because uh, it's a kind of a strange situation that uh, Europe was supposed to be uh, more, let's say, in favor of common goods and so on. Uh, and the European Parliament just voted uh, a few days ago against, uh, uh, let's say, leaving patents for a while uh, to a large, a bit a large majority. So. Biden is uh, more progressist uh, than, uh, than uh, Europe. And by the way, Biden just a few uh, days ago declared that we, uh, we should have, well, you should have, <laughs> I would say, in the US, a kind of a DARPA uh, for health. Uh, and this would be uh, great. And he is uh, speaking explicitly about Alzheimer's disease, about kind of a war against cancer. So, well, maybe it will be only a, a, a nice declaration but I think uh, it would be good to push, of course. Yes, well, any sort of acceleration of research in these directions would be beneficial. Jose, any thoughts on this? Uh, yeah, well, uh, property rights are evolving also, and with this decentralization of many of these things, um, I think we are moving in the right direction. So um, this is not my area of expertise, but I think we are moving slowly, but um, surely in the best uh, possible direction. Thanks to many people in many countries giving different opinions, doing different things. So I actually like competition because competition gives the best possible results. We need to have a lot of alternatives, like even the vaccines, you know, I. This is probably the first time that you can talk, oh, which vaccine can I take? You know, before you, you didn't have a choice of vaccines. Now you do. 
And these vaccines were incredible. They were developed in only a few hours after the genome of the virus was sent by uh, email. The, the developers of Moderna and, and BioNTech, Pfizer, they did not have a physical copies of the virus. They just got the email with the genome. This is magic, you know. Uh, even for us, 10 years ago, this would have been impossible. Anyway, uh, so property rights is not my area of expertise, but I think competition is good. So we have competing vaccines, yeah. we have competing treatments, and we will let the best win. Yeah. Just, just to say in one word, uh, well, the, the principle of uh, patents is just is, uh, precisely that you suppress competition for a while, and uh, uh, the direction of the IP at the moment is not is is really going to be uh, more and more and longer and longer. There is, for example, in the U.S. the, the so-called uh, uh, um, Donald no Disney or Mickey Mouse uh, exception. So it's always going up and up and up. Uh, um, so it's well, in my opinion, it's not going to uh, go in the uh, in the in the good direction. Uh, certainly not. Except maybe with the the the, the virus, no. But that's a, a more political uh, discussion. And but I would like I would like to have the, the opinion about some some of you. Uh, I'm asking the question, though I would say, but about this all these problems related to privacy and that it's uh, almost impossible now to share uh, health data even if you want. So I will uh, put a link about uh, an idea of uh, Sonair that I like. Uh, yeah. Yes, indeed. I hope that we can discuss the subject of privacy. Uh, what I will say uh, in terms of some brief thoughts is in the United States, it seems the legal framework surrounding privacy is overly restrictive with regard to individuals' ability to access their own information, but overly permissive in regard to uh, corporations getting that information for unrelated purposes like marketing or analytics purposes that the individual didn't opt into. So uh, the United States has uh, what is called HIPAA, the Health Insurance uh, Portability and Accountability Act of 1996, where sometimes at least it gets interpreted by healthcare providers to make it very difficult for people to get their own health information from those healthcare providers in electronic format. Uh, one has to uh, sometimes go through a series of steps to get it in hard copy. And yet it's very possible for third parties to mine uh, one's web browsing data, for instance, or social media interactions or other aspects, consumer financial behavior. And those can be used in ways that consumers uh, frankly have no knowledge of, no way to anticipate, no way uh, to really provide guidance regarding. So I think the balance of access needs to be changed to make it easier for individuals to access their own data, opt into sharing data, make it more difficult for unrelated third parties to access people's data without their knowledge and consent. Jason, it seems like you have something to say on this. Yeah, I, I think this is there like a different set of rules in Europe than in, in the United States. I, I know that uh, there is like a separate thing about dis, you know disclosure uh, agreement or that you got to fill out for for Europe or for something that's going to be in Europe. And I'm just wondering, um, do you guys think that set of guidelines is better than what we got or? Nah, I, I think it's called G. I think it's GDPR. Yeah, that, that, that's it. That's yeah. it. Yes, it, uh, in very in very short, uh, GDPR is uh, uh, more protecting uh, the right to privacy than the rules in the U.S. And uh, I think it has good aspects, but certainly concerning uh, sharing of uh, data for uh, science and for health, uh, it has bad aspects. Theoretically, in the GDPR, there, is, uh, there are a few exceptions. There is, uh, among other things, exception for science, 
but practically it's not working. Uh, to be very short, uh, when you apply GDPR, you are almost uh, unable to uh, to uh, share data for anything. Uh, yeah, I could I could give you a few uh, funny examples. I will give you only one. Uh, um, in in Belgium, you cannot ask uh, to a colleague when he uh, what is. Uh, you cannot uh, wish a happy birthday to a colleague because uh, the day of birth is uh, some uh, is protected by GDPR. Wow. Yes. Sometimes these kinds of rules have uh, odd implications. If there were a way to easily build in a common sense exemption, uh, I would be completely in favor of that. Uh, and I do think with regard to privacy, the key is to recognize the sovereignty of individuals over their own data, but that could mean the allowance for individuals to share their information as well. And uh, sometimes the current regulatory frameworks on privacy are overly restrictive in that regard. There's not an easy way for individuals to opt into the sharing of their own information, or for that matter, to opt out of common methods of sharing information. Uh, there are recently on many websites disclosures about the use of cookies. And indeed, these uh, disclosures pop up whenever one tries to access a website. And it says essentially, we use cookies for various purposes. Uh, click on uh, this link to configure your preferences. Interestingly enough, when you open that link, the vast majority of the cookies uh, come to be turned off by default. I think it's because the system recognizes that if you're the kind of customer who would click that kind of link, you're probably concerned about your privacy enough that you don't want your cookies uh, used for targeting or advertising, marketing to third parties, that kind of activity. Probably if you don't click on that link, all of the cookies will be enabled by default. So now people have to go through that extra step of clicking on the link to uh, make sure that only strictly necessary cookies uh, are being used. And one does wonder, could there be a simpler way to get people to configure their preferences in a manner that sets a kind of default openness or lack of openness to the sharing of information and that would follow them to various sites so they don't have to configure cookies on each individual website, which is very time consuming. Now, Alexandria, you had some questions that you wanted to ask. Okay, I was thinking of the stellar example of nebula genomics, where you can get very rich DNA information about yourself, and you can let that be used anonymously or not by uh, whatever, uh, whoever wants to research something that is relevant to you. That's a good example. I also wanted to mention that, uh, you, oh, back to bounties and hackathons. Why don't we organize society around goals? Like uh, we wanna support a Mars mission or we wanna support longevity escape velocity. And we can be on several of these. And, but they are, they're self-governing that uh, much like our party, we will mostly hold the large consensus. If anybody wants to do a, uh, a work of that project, that's also possible. But there's, um, it, it just does so much to cut out the middleman, to not make this about making money per se, but shared goals. We can, check, I, we can look up some links later. Yes, thank you, Alexandria. Any thoughts? Yeah, uh, well, two, uh, uh, maybe I didn't understand everything perfectly, but uh, I think the second part of your intervention, Alexandria, uh, Alexandria, it's close to the projects of uh, X Prize. You know, they are creating uh, big prizes to uh, promote uh, 
And for example, they have uh, the X price have a big uh, price. I think uh, hundred million. Or I don't know. It's very, very uh, a lot of money uh, for the decarbonization. Uh, yeah. So that's one aspect. And uh, concerning the first aspect of your uh, question, uh, remark in France, not in the rest of Europe, but in France, it's even prohibited to analyze your own DNA when you don't have uh, an authorization of a medical doctor. So it's a, it's a very, very strange situation. You can not legally, because practically it's quite easy to do it, but legally you cannot check your own DNA. This is a, a against the law. Uh, you can be fined in theory. Yes, and in the United States, there was a time period when the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, tried to restrict 23andMe from selling uh, DNA analysis kits to people over the counter because the FDA had this strange concern that people would either misinterpret the results or they would act very impulsively like if they had uh, some sort of genetic predisposition to cancer, they would immediately uh, try to get some sort of extreme surgery to correct it. Uh, of course, people are a lot more nuanced in their judgments, but I think all of the problems that you describe, DDA, are the result of individuals being restricted from using their own data and opting into the sharing of their own data. And there's a 23andMe kit that Edward has shown. Edward, do you have any uh, questions or comments regarding the conversation thus far? Uh, yeah, just a few. First of all, because we are positive here and we like to emphasize good news, uh, uh, some of you probably know, maybe your listeners don't, uh, the breakthrough that was announced for the CRISPR-Cas9 uh, and genetic editing tool maybe about three weeks ago or a month ago, and uh, this is a genetic editing tool that can take out pieces of DNA. Well, the latest uh, breakthrough is uh, an ability for this tool, genetic tool to turn on and off how genetic material expresses itself. And the upshot of this and what they're looking at now is turning off the genetic material in a neuron, a brain cell, that causes the tau protein to, uh, to, to grow. And the clumping of tau protein is what causes Alzheimer's. So literally as of a month ago, we had this announcement that we may have the technology now to turn off the gene that is most associated with Alzheimer's or the genetic material. So just a little bit of happy news, even though everyone is still depressed about the coronavirus. <laughs> I want to <coughs> offer that. But a couple of things, and maybe Jose and, and, and both of you can comment on this. I do think the issue of optimism and pessimism in a culture really is very important. Uh, Peter Thiel in his book, Zero to One, has an entire section <clears throat> discussing uh, the attitudes in the United States during certain periods, Europe during certain periods, which tends to be very pessimistic, I'm sad to say, and then in, in Asia as well. So uh, for those of you who are interested, there's a very good discussion. And I find this myself as I'm, promoting futurist ideas. And I find that really a lot of times I am banging up against a lot of pessimism. But the other thing, this is more to the points that both of you have, which is why, by the way, Jose and I tend to be right on the same uh, page uh, because of his infectious optimism. Uh, but uh, the other thing I wanna bring up is the importance of entrepreneurship uh, in making these kinds of discoveries and these, this kind of progress. Uh, uh, Jose, I was in Berlin the first time in 1981 and went to the Berlin Wall and went into the East. I was in the Soviet Union in 1981 as well. And then I was there in 89 and 90 running free market conferences to try to bring down the regime. So I'm certainly familiar with the bad situation. But one of the problems I see is that we, 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 we want a system in which the government performs its valid functions, but too often what you find is that uh, they, 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 they establish an institution or institutional interest that's supposed to be good, and this is where I want uh, to hear about the situation in Europe, they're supposed to help people, but in the end they become cer certainly bureaucrats with their their own interests. Example, the Food and Drug Administration in this country was set up in 1962 to help 
keep protect people from bad medicines. Now it simply blocks m much innovation. Uh, we have a Medicare system in this country for retirees. It really is a sick care system. And the way it's structured now actually blocks the kind of innovations that we see with wearable technologies and so forth that could really keep people healthy into their hundreds, 120 and so forth. We see this in this country with the current unemployment system, which does not allow the people who have the money taken out of their paychecks to robot proof themselves. And I know, by the way, speaking of robots, I know in Europe and in the European parliament has considered robot taxes because robots are unfair competition. Uh, and I could go on and on about uh, this. I actually sent an email to uh, Joe Biden before he was a candidate uh, because uh, he, his son died of cancer and one of my brothers uh, unfortunately died of cancer. And I was trying to interest him in FDA reform and other reforms. But unfortunately, what you tend to find is that a lot of the interests in government that are meant to, you know, to help promote better energy and these kinds of things simply become stagnant bureaucracies and are counterproductive and are difficult to get through. So I'd like to hear the comments of both of you gentlemen on this problem, which again, I've been uh, fighting for, for many, many uh, decades, especially with the Food and Drug Administration and some of these health uh, matters. Yes. May I begin or Jose? Yeah, I'll get begin. Table okay, so, so first, <laughs> yeah, not in French. <laughs> uh, so uh, first, I, 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 I partly agree. And for me, it's something ki kind of fascinating. It's, it's kind of general. So first you have a goal, then you create an organization. And then after a while, the goal is the organization and not anymore the first goal. So this is a problem of bureaucracy. But where the first place where I disagree is bureaucracy is not only in public institutions. Bu bureaucracy is also in the uh, companies world, is also in the, well, uh, especially the, the world of the banks, insurance, and so on. But okay, uh, agree. I agree. That's, the, that's one point where I agree. One other point where I agree, and I said it already, it's... Uh, bureaucracy is especially a big problem for all questions related to uh, technological progress and especially for all questions related to uh, health and longevity because of course uh, uh, there are more there are risks there and of course when you are searching you don't know what you will find so it's very difficult for one state to say you have to go in this direction and so on okay but on the other side uh, the best, uh, so we are living the best day for the for humanity. But I think at the moment the best place to live in the world is still uh, Europe and not the U.S. because of uh, inequalities and because life expectancy is uh, lower, and not in Asia because the uh, yeah the level of democracy is uh, lower and the level the, the level of uh, uh, wellness is also uh, lower, except in some countries uh, and. Uh, uh, but the state is also very useful uh, to uh, to uh, diminish inequalities, and in uh, Europe, the state is also very useful uh, for medical care. I mean, uh, uh, people are living longer in the in Europe than in the US uh, because of uh, because there are less differences between rich and poor, but also uh, because the medical care is better. Uh, I had. Uh, I had one uh, heart infarct uh, two years ago, and uh, so I I survived because I'm in, in Belgium and I was close from an hospital, and uh, the total the total cost for that I had to pay was thousand uh, dollars or something like that. In the U.S., it would have been I don't know twenty thousand dollars or something like that. Okay, that's uh, that's it. So I agree, bureaucracy is a big problem especially for scientific progress, especially, and especially for medical progress, and probably more in the states, uh, for the states than for the private enterprises, but also for the private uh, enterprises. But the states are also useful for more uh, equality and so for more progress. I also think that uh, bureaucracy is a problem everywhere, anywhere, anytime. And, um, 
part of the problem is that bureaucracies are very slow. By their very nature, they are slow. And technology changes fast, faster. Uh, it is in an accelerating uh, 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 rhythm in a way. So bureaucracy will always be behind the technology. And that is a problem, a big problem. And the other thing is I mentioned human stupidity. I think politicians in some countries are some of the most stupid uh, people. They are even more stupid than the average person sometimes. So if we worry about human stupidity, we have to worry about political stupidity. Also, um, you know, politicians are not leaders. They are normally followers. They follow the trends. They don't lead the trends many times. And this is important. For example, uh, here I have my book, The Death of Death. And uh, most people don't know that we discovered that cancer is immortal in 1951. That is a long, long time ago, 1951, okay? 70 years ago, but most people don't know it. Especially many politicians don't know it. A few ones, like maybe Biden, because indeed uh, his son died of cancer and uh, some other people, but most people are not aware that cancer cells are immortal. And I think this is a key message. People need to know that cancer discovered how to become immortal. And cancer will lead to one of the doors, not a single door, but several doors towards immortality or amortality. So uh, just uh, repeating, yeah, bureaucracies are bad. They are very slow by their own nature. And politicians are no, normally followers, not leaders. So they have to be educated together with the public. By the way, Jose, I'll just make one quick comment and I have to go off, I'm afraid. But the, the point about ignorance, uh, one of the issues that is always comes up in political and cultural discussions is rational ignorance. That is to say, uh, and especially in this era where we have, we're overwhelmed by information and it's hard right now to sort through the good stuff and the bad stuff. Rational ignorance is, well, look, I can't know everything about it. It doesn't affect me directly. So I'll only figure out something, uh, you know, when it's, when it's uh, necessary, but it's becoming an even more serious problem in an advanced technological society with exponential uh, uh, technology changing things so rapidly. Um, and, uh, and plus our educate, want to talk about antiquated systems, our education system, and especially in the United States is very, very antiquated. Peter Diamandis likes to say it's baroque and broke. And so for a future discussion, I think that that's really, uh, really important because when I talk about these things with audiences, and you know this as well, Jose and Janati, you know this as well, they'll say, what? I didn't know that about cancer. What? I didn't know that about the CRISPR gene uh, editing thing. What? I didn't know that about, you know, fill in the blank. And so it's a challenge I think all of us have. It's not just stupidity. I think politicians are fundamentally stupid. It's even decent people who want a better life have this, uh, this challenge of how to keep up with the information. Yes, information overload is an issue that I think all of us have to contend with because even though technologies of communication have indeed advanced exponentially, our brain's processing capabilities have not. We are still biologically the same creatures as our evolutionary ancestors have been. So techniques for handling, prioritizing that increasing and accelerating influx of information are going to be ever more important as time progresses. Uh, so thank you, Edward, for those remarks. Now, I would like to uh, go to several other panelists to see uh, what questions or comments they may have. Let us go to Art Ramon Garcia. Yeah, um, one of the things I've noticed is the military gets the best technology, yet they're still stuck on fossil fuel. Suppose that in a decade, most of the planet is already using electric vehicles, you know, tractor trailers, farm equipment, all electric, but the military is still stuck using fossil fuels because maybe it still has a slight advantage over anything electric. 
Uh, and we're still going to have wars because the military is stuck using fossil fuel. What can happen where we can advance beyond that? I mean, they get the best research, they get the best technology. Why are they stuck on fossil fuels? Uh, let's go to Jose uh, for his answer on why uh, the military is still stuck on fossil fuels. Okay, um, uh, Ramon, obviously they have huge investments and so much uh, machinery with uh, bureaucracy, if you want, in a way. So it takes some time to change into newer technologies, but I don't think they will. Also, I personally don't like the military much. I think we should use that money for better uses like curing aging. Uh, curing all diseases, it could be better. The war should be against aging and death. That is our common war of humanity. But going back to the US military, I actually think they will modernize. Uh, but again, there is the bureaucracy factor. There is the uh, slowness, uh, you know, change of regimes and, uh, and trends. But uh, anyway, uh, we should reduce armies throughout the planet and increase funding for anti-aging. So forget about militaries in the future where we are more prosperous and happier and more longevous. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you, Jose. And Didier, any comments on? Well, very short. Uh, yeah, I, I, never, I never thought about this specific aspect, uh, but okay, we still have a lot of uh, fossil fuels. So let's imagine that uh, uh, most uh, uh, energy that we use is no renewable energy, but that army uh, continues to use uh, fossil uh, fuel. This is not the biggest problem I can uh, imagine. Uh, yeah, uh, that's that's all. <laughs> and uh, well, uh, there are a lot of problems uh, with uh, armies and uh, especially with. Uh, artificial intelligence related to uh, new technologies and uh, artificial intelligence and new technologies who make it uh, each day easier to destroy ourselves. Uh, but this problem looks to me uh, quite specific. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you, Didier. We have a few comments in the chat from our viewers. John H. states that submarines have been nuclear for decades and many surface ships now use some form of nuclear power as well. Uh, Jason Mallory states that controlling the oil flow determines what militaries can mobilize thwarts unnecessary wars without US military direct involvement. I do wonder though, uh, to what extent the uh, access to fossil fuels or the search for access to fossil fuels has prompted military intervention. It's interesting because the US has been involved in the Middle East for decades, primarily, uh, I think because of concerns about how the geopolitical situation in the Middle East would affect the availability of fossil fuels. But interestingly, over the course of the past decade, as various alternative energy sources became more economical, uh, US foreign policy in the uh, Middle East seems to be on a declining trajectory. There is less interest now to start new military occupations, even if uh, there might be some humanitarian concerns in certain uh, Middle Eastern regions and countries. Uh, there is no longer the same kind of push to get U.S. troops involved. I think because uh, the U.S. is achieving a greater degree of energy independence, not just with alternative energy, but also uh, the U.S.'s own stores of fossil fuels. There is more access to oil and natural gas from within the United States than had been the case, uh, say, in the early 2000s. Uh, but it's an interesting conversation. 
Mike Lazine in the chat says uh, that he thinks humans will always need some form of military, no matter what nation we live in. Uh, he doesn't see the whole human race ever becoming benevolent. I wonder with regard to uh, advances in neuroscience and modifications to the human psyche, uh, DDA, since the Viridian Manifesto talks about uh, those kinds of uh, cognitive modifications, do you think it may be possible eventually to have humans who don't want to engage in offensive military conflict, who only might ever think of using the military for very strictly limited defensive purposes? Well, uh, there are two aspects. First, concerning uh, the, the, let's say, evolution without transhumanism. Um, okay, it's already the case uh, in, uh, in Europe. It's already the case in the uh, US. It's already, uh, so there are uh, big parts of the world where we don't use uh, armies anymore. The problem on the other side is that it's becoming uh, easier each day to destroy ourselves with uh, with arms. So it could be we are kind of uh, maybe one day we will be able to change ourselves and to, to change our, our neuro uh, our, our way to uh, to think uh, in a way that it will be psychologically. Uh, almost impossible to kill uh, to kill uh, other people, and it could be really necessary because of technical evolution. And uh, one aspect is if one day we become immortal, we don't uh, die anymore of old age. Their violence will be a lot more complicated, less uh, thinkable. But is that enough uh, without uh, uh, without um, Let's say working on our own brains. I don't. I don't know. And that's that's really one place. Once again, uh, Jose, where I would love to be uh, optimist, uh, but I think optimism without thinking about this is dangerous. Uh, well, I obviously agree. We we cannot be stupid or foolish about any of this, but also if we look at the long term trends. As Steve Pinker has written in his books, uh, The Better Angels of Our Nature, and more recently, Enlightenment Now, he actually tracks how we humans were truly barbaric, uh, basically like animals, killing other animals and yeah. killing other humans. We are less barbaric today. Sure. We don't do human sacrifices. We don't have a official slavery. We don't have official as, um, minor labor. Uh, women have almost uh, equal rights everywhere in the planet. We have advanced a lot, uh, incredibly. And I think this will continue, hopefully even more with artificial intelligence. So I think that trend is positive. We have to keep on uh, thinking about the future always and concerned, of course. I don't want to be uh, easily delusional or thinking that everything is fine because it is not fine. The fact that there is poverty, the fact that there are dictators like in Venezuela, Cuba, North Korea show, shows how stupid we are and why we still need armies, I guess. But I think there will be a future not too far away uh, where the world will be better and the enemy, the common enemy of humanity is aging and death. Yes, this is yeah. our common enemy. Yeah, but once again, uh, uh, Jose, we agree about, uh, I totally agree with everything that you said, but the new thing is this capacity to destroy ourselves. Uh, and there, one mistake is enough, you know, that's, uh, yeah, uh, okay. And, and this capacity to destroy is itself is going up with technological progress. That's, that's uh, my biggest uh, uh, problem for the, for the, well, one of my biggest problems, it's in my opinion, one of the biggest problems for a not so far future. And maybe I, I want to say one thing more because we, the time uh, is uh, advancing. We were not speaking at all. I, I saw one comment, uh, we were not speaking at all about uh, uh, all uh, problems related to uh, biodiversity. Uh, and, and I think uh, this is also one potential big problem. 
especially, like I said uh, during my introduction, uh, especially the questions related to the fact that insects are disappearing and we don't know why. But that's because we are almost at the end and we had no time for this. I, I want I want to to say that uh, the the person who was writing that is right. Sorry, stopping. Yes, thank you, Didier. Ah. Go ahead, Jose. Yeah, yeah. Let me just make a quick comment. Thank you, uh, John Dono, that you will vote for me, but I'm not running for elections in the USA. Uh, but thank you. And to answer my my dear co-author David Wood about the arguments about the Steve uh, Pinker that could have been done before World War One. Well, I, I don't think uh, they could be done in the same way. Before World War One, women did not vote in most of the planet. And they were treated almost like animals in many countries. And there was a slavery, official slavery is still in some countries. And there was child labor. All that has changed. The fact that women vote now, I think is a very good sign that there will be more peaceful times, I think. And uh, so, so it, it cannot be compared what happened 100 years ago or even 50 years ago. And look at now, there are relatively very few wars, even with the sudden clashes between Israel and Palestine, or between Venezuela and Colombia, or Syria and its neighbors, or Libya. Anyway, we live in the most peaceful time ever, ever, the most peaceful time. But as my friend Peter Diamandis says, CNN should be called crisis news network, the crisis news network. So only crisis, only bad news. But again, go to sleep safely. This is the best time with less words in human history. Yes, and it's interesting to consider how much we have progressed in ways that haven't been emphasized at all by mass media because of uh, the sensationalist bias, this focus on extraordinary events that attract a lot of attention, attract a lot of views. Many people have pointed out that uh, if all of the headlines in newspapers were along the lines of this particular indicator of well-being improved by a modest percentage today, uh, there would be less readership, unfortunately, for uh, those kinds of publications, even though they would be more accurate. Now, Max had some uh, comments and questions that I would invite him to pose briefly uh, in discussion of uh, neuroscience and possible improvements to the human psyche. Yeah, uh, it was uh, mentioned earlier, Didier, that if we could modify our brains in particular ways that you were saying that we would modify them in ways that were, one could say, more pro-social or with a longer term time horizon where we're, we're thinking more about our, our impact long term. But it seems to me just as likely that individuals would modify them entirely in the opposite way. Uh, once you realize that your impact on the long term sort of health of the planet, for example, is completely minuscule, uh, then you may modify yourself to not care about that at all so that you don't have any uh, uh, sense of guilt. Um, so for example, voting is very similar. We all know the rational arguments uh, against uh, rational ignorant arguments and other arguments for why when you go to the voting booth, you might as well um, enjoy voting for whatever crazy thing you want because it maybe makes you feel good while it has virtually no impact whatsoever on the actual outcome of an election. Um, so, so why is it that you believe that if we had the ability to modify our beliefs or values or long-term goals, that we would modify them in a kind of specific uh, pro-social or pro-long-term or pro-communitarian or however you want to describe it direction? Yes, good, good question. Uh, that's not something uh, sure that it, well, I, I, first, I want to say I'm uh, more optimistic for uh, longevity, even if, it'll not, it, if, even if it will not be easy, than about changing our own brains. Because uh, brain, uh, yeah, many people say brain is the more complicated thing in the universe. It's very, very, very complicated. We still don't have anything to change it uh, really. 
uh, well, uh, at least in a kind of to change our minds on the long term, it's still totally uh, uh, impossible. So that's the first aspect. It's not for tomorrow. Uh, the second aspect, you have many uh, ethical questions related to this. But uh, uh, third aspect is indeed, if this is possible, it will be also possible in bad directions. But there, I'm kind of uh, optimistic. <laughs> um, I think, I, I really think, uh, you, you know, actually, uh, there are kind of two ways to see people, to see people as good in most cases, or to see people as bad in most cases. And I think people are good in most cases and uh, wanting the best for themselves, but also wanting the best for the, the others. Uh, and if they can uh, improve themselves, uh, they will choose to improve themselves uh, uh, in, the, in the large majority. But uh, yeah, this is not uh, also uh, because this would be, uh, there is, that's one aspect, improving ourselves in the good way, let's say morally good way, but there is also uh, improving ourselves to be happier. Uh, but once again, this is not for tomorrow. But, and once again, once again, this is not for tomorrow. Your question is a good question. Uh, and of course, it's also, uh, we should uh, try to find ways to improve ourselves, not to uh, be uh, better to destroy each other. Jose, what are your thoughts on the possibilities for technologically improving the human mind and in response to Max, how would you address the concerns that any modifications might not necessarily be in the directions that we would find desirable? Um, well, actually, that is not one of my major areas of expertise or even interest in a way. So uh, I don't want to make comments because I don't feel qualified uh, in that area. I actually uh, think uh, if we find problems, we will try to solve them. Um, the implications are very difficult, very complicated. It's like also when talking about the GDPR in Europe, I have no position because there are many good views, bad views, different opinions, and that is not my area. So when I don't know something, I prefer not to talk about that. So I really have no opinion, but uh, if we find a problem, we will try to solve it. That is my philosophy. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I want to just, so you just adding one sentence. Uh, it's not also, it's also not my best uh, uh, domain. So I uh, advise people interested in this to take a look at the uh, at Julian uh, Sabulescu. He is really the, the, the guy who was uh, thinking about this. But there is one, uh, uh, let's say, uh, less positive point. It's more in a, he is thinking about this on a, on a philosophical uh, way, not on a practical way, because once again, there is nothing uh, at the moment practically. That's all. Yes, thank you. Now, I do want to briefly ask a question to follow up on both of your thoughts regarding uh, future human population trajectories. Now, uh, Jose had pointed out that an additional human is not just a mouth to feed. Uh, that person is also a brain and somebody who can contribute future innovations, uh, hopefully, involving the more effective use of resources to fulfill human needs. And Didier, you have pointed out that in societies where life expectancy has increased and other economic opportunities have increased as well, uh, people tend to have fewer children, I think, in large part because there are other ways to spend one's time at the same time the opportunity cost of having a child increases as well. Uh, but Jose, you also pointed out the dangers of demographic collapse as may happen in China, uh, likely because of the legacy of the one child policy that was pursued for several decades, uh, which has essentially resulted in a situation where future generations are going to be smaller than current generations. So what would you think would be 
the best case outcome in terms of uh, overall population? Would you see a stabilization as being the best so that we don't have demographic collapse? Uh, we don't have unsustainable population growth, though I doubt, uh, based on precedents of human history, that that's actually possible in a technological society. And furthermore, do you think that the growth in lifespans of individuals could serve as a check on demographic collapse if uh, the birth rates continue to reduce, but the people who are alive today continue to be alive and in good health, maybe becoming more youthful over time, then that would contribute to a scenario of either stable or very modestly growing population. What are your thoughts as to the future trajectories there? Okay, let me continue on that because I already talked about the uh, demographic implosion in China and the decrease of population in Japan and Russia, Spain, Italy, Germany. It's really a big crisis, um, the population decreasing in these countries. So your question depends on the time frame. Are we talking 10 years into the future, one century into the future, one millennia into the future? Because we are, we are experiencing um, exponential change and the realities will change radically. I am very singularitarian. Therefore, I do believe that by the year 2045, we will reach this technological singularity where a global artificial intelligence will surpass human intelligence and fuse with us, merge with us, enhance, improve humans. So uh, I don't think there will be demographic, economic, political collapse before 2045. And then we will enter a new world, a transhuman world. And then uh, uh, all these realities of the present will no longer be applicable. So that's my singularitarian, transhumanist, and immortalist view from here to the end of uh, 2045, which is the end of the human age and the beginning of the post-human age. Interesting. And of course, questions about human population after that time horizon would be uh, let's say subject to a very different framework of understanding and interpretation uh, as contrasted with the presence. So very interesting thoughts, Jose. Didier, what are your thoughts on future population trajectories? Yes, uh, uh, very briefly, I think on the long term, it's impossible to have uh, uh, some uh, ideas because, well, a central question is, uh, uh, if uh, well, let's let's imagine that things are going the way we hope uh, all here. So uh, in twenty to thirty years, we have uh, 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 radically uh, better uh, um, healthy life uh, expectancy. The central question is: Will people decide to uh, still have uh, children or not? Uh, until now. Um, it seems that the answer is far less children. And uh, if it stays this way, we, uh, we are, I think, uh, like you were saying, in a stable uh, situation uh, for uh, at least uh, 30, 40, 50, uh, 60 years. And uh, we can handle um, a growth of the population like uh, 0 0.5 or one, even 1% 1 per year without uh, big problems. But let's imagine, I don't think this is uh, something uh, where there is a big, big risk. Let's, let's imagine uh, uh, people know, uh, know we have everything uh, we need. So let's start to have uh, children. It could be a problem. But uh, I, I think the, the probability is uh, very slow. Uh, a, 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 a small remark, uh, Jose, uh, in Germany and in Spain, at the moment, the population is not yet decreasing. The population is decreasing in Japan, is decreasing in Russia, but not yet in, uh, in Germany and uh, uh, in Spain. And it was, well, in, in China, uh, it, it's almost decreasing, but not, not yet, I, at least with official uh, statistics, uh, of course, uh, yeah. So uh, yeah, that, that, that's it. 
with also the remark uh, situation in uh, sub-Saharan Africa is kind of uh, specific uh, and also, uh, yeah, it's, it's specific. Mm -hmm. We will see also. Yes, uh, and just let me let me add quickly. Yeah, indeed, uh, in Spain and Germany, the official total population is not declining, but that's because there is already uh, 15 to 20 percent immigration in the country. But the original Spanish population and German population has been declining for over 20 years. And that decline has been compensated by immigration. But even that immigration is, uh, is declining. So the population will start decline officially in Spain in less than five years and probably okay. in Germany too. Okay, okay, yes, yes. If you, if you don't take uh, immigration uh, in consideration, uh, you're right, okay. Yeah, same situation in Belgium then. Yes, but, and I think I mean, immigration is, uh, was already the case uh, many years ago. Huh? Yeah. Immigration is going to be an important factor in stabilizing standards of living and ensuring that standards of living continue to improve in certain countries. Uh, but as you pointed out, Didier, population growth rates are declining everywhere. It's just the absolute growth rates are still quite high in regions such as sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, but I think that underscores the importance of bringing improved education and access to technology to people in sub-Saharan Africa, both people who uh, decide to stay there and people who decide to emigrate to uh, other countries because then uh, we would have essentially a new source of not just people, but skilled, highly creative people, people who can readily adapt to life in uh, more developed societies and hopefully develop uh, sub-Saharan African societies as well. It's one of the reasons why the U.S. Transhumanist Party collaborates with uh, various groups on the uh, African continent. Uh, one of our allied organizations is TAFTS, the Transdisciplinary Agora for Future Discussions. And TAFTS has a presence in many parts of the world. It has a presence in the United States, but it also has a presence in various African countries. So we're seeking to cultivate uh, interest in transhumanism and in advanced technologies among people in that part of the world so that they can essentially bring that region up to uh, where other parts of the world uh, have been over the past several decades and hopefully even leapfrog past uh, the conditions in some Western countries. So it's definitely an aspect to uh, watch. Didier uh, said that populations are decreasing fairly slowly in countries like Nigeria. And Nigeria, by the way, is one of the countries uh, with which we have some of the closest ties. And on the other hand, younger people can indeed mean more people in favor of new technologies. I agree with you on that, DGA. There, There's a tremendous talent pool that I think uh, is waiting to be unleashed upon the world uh, with a few, uh, let's say, enabling systems and structures. Uh, so I really hope that many more young people in sub-Saharan Africa start taking an interest in transhumanism and emerging technologies in new decentralized methods of education that can really get uh, this kind of knowledge and skill sets uh, to them much faster. Uh, so thank you for that discussion. Now I know we're past our two hour mark so uh, I wanted to offer each of you the opportunity to make any closing statements about this conversation and anything else that you think could be added to the discussion. Um, well, again, uh, we have uh, a lot of challenges ahead. Um, you know, we are trying to eliminate uh, poverty and hunger by 2030. That is the goal of the World Bank. I don't know if we will make it, but still the human condition will continue improving and at an accelerating 
rating rate all over the planet. Uh, so I am positive we have to keep on working towards that goal so that all humanity races moves up into transhumanism so that everybody has a chance to participate in the fantastic future ahead. And um, I want to say again, I'm very optimistic and you have to tell your friends, your family that you love them more than yesterday, but less than tomorrow. The same with the future. The future is much better than the past and it will be even better, better in the future because it is still improving exponentially ahead of us. Yes, absolutely. And I definitely share your hopes and aspirations in that regard, Jose. And Didier, what are your closing remarks? Difficult uh, to make closer remarks. It will be a little bit of uh, everything uh, short. One uh, great discussion, many interesting uh, things. Uh, two, uh, I still think uh, today is at, at the same time uh, the best days of uh, the history and the most dangerous and tomorrow will be even better and even worse <laughs> at the same time. Uh, so we have to think in the two directions uh, together. Concerning the, uh, let's say, uh, the difficult direction concerning uh, 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 sustainable uh, uh, body in a sustainable world, I'm a little bit, there is, some, there is one point where I'm a little bit disappointed. We were not speaking about uh, enough, I think, about, uh, let's say, the aspects concerning uh, risk to the uh, risk related to pollution, to nano, tech, to nano things, and so on. But that's maybe for another time. Uh, and uh, I'm happy that we all agree here on many things, especially about the thing that uh, living longer and healthier thanks to uh, new technologies is good for us, is good for the planet uh, and is good for the future. That's it. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. And this is certainly a much more extensive conversation that hopefully we will be able to continue uh, over the coming months and years, hopefully for our audience, this was a good introduction to uh, both the Viridian Manifesto and Jose's uh, ideas and observations about human progress and uh, potential future directions for our economies and societies. And also, I would say uh, this session brought uh, to our awareness, the fact that we, I think, live in increasingly high stakes times, as DDA mentioned, and I think we all agree there is unprecedented abundance and opportunities and potential for improved well-being, but there are also some significant risks. And one of the core ideals, the third core ideal of the U.S. Transhumanist Party is with regard to using science, technology, and rationality in order to mitigate and eliminate existential risks facing the human species. Uh, I have often said that we are essentially experiencing a race between these two elements, the positive beneficial aspects of technological progress and then the deleterious dynamics that give rise to uh, these uh, kinds of threats. Uh, some of them are existential risks, nuclear weapons being uh, a principal existential risk that has existed since 1945. So I would like to thank our presenters, uh, Didier and Jose, for bringing attention both to the promises and some of the dangers that are facing our species. And hopefully this discussion will be of benefit to our viewers with regard to motivating them in navigating that future toward the best possible outcomes. That is what we strive to do at our virtual enlightenment salons. And please check back with us every Sunday, generally at 1 p.m. US Pacific time for these kinds of wide ranging and thought provoking conversations. And until then, live long and prosper. Live long and prosper.